At 1,776 feet and 104 stories, One World Trade Center is the tallest building in the United States and the Western Hemisphere, and the seventh tallest building in the world. It's the most expensive skyscraper in the world, with an estimated final cost of over $3.9 billion. It has the strongest concrete ever used in a skyscraper. It has a million square feet of crystal clear glass, the safest, most sustainable, and largest panels ever to clad a skyscraper, cover its upper reaches. It was constructed over functioning rail lines, the PATH, and number one subway. It has an observatory, five elevators that are the fastest in the Americas, traveling 100 stories in less than one minute. One World Trade is projected to earn LEED Gold certification, and most importantly, there were no deaths during the 14 years of its planning and construction. Extraordinary for a project of this complexity and scope. One World Trade is just one of nine major structures that comprise the ensemble of buildings at the Trade Center. Architectural historian Judith Dupre is my guest today. Her beautiful and comprehensive book, just published by Little Brown, is a detailed analysis of the rebuilding, not only of One World Trade, but of the entire site, including the memorial and museum. Judith takes us on a journey from that horrific day, 9-11, from the moment New York City Mayor Rudolph Giuliani and others vowed to rebuild through the evolution of the plans, the constantly changing cast of talent, influence, and the emergence of a new city in Lower Manhattan. Is the Trade Center a success? Does it incorporate the notion of sacred into a secular setting? In its apparent restraint and simplicity, does the new Trade Center emphasize individual engagement in a way the original Twin Towers did not? We'll ask Judith, the official biographer of One World Trade Center. She actually says it best in the afterword to her book. The site is so vested with memories, sorrow, and ambition that no building could meet the layers of expectation laid on it. Judith Dupre is a graduate of Brown and Yale Universities. She's also the recipient of numerous prestigious awards and was a 2015 National Endowment for the Humanities Public Scholar. I'm Alice Bloom. This is A Town and Village Two. Welcome back. Judith, thanks so much for being my guest. This was the most amazing book I have ever read. I mean, certainly it's fraught with emotion. I mean, who mm. is not affected by 9-11? Um, but you are able to make a building come to life. And the uh -huh. whole experience of constructing this building, which was a drama in itself, is like a play. I mean, you, you live it. We live it with you. You seem to have put this book together in record time. When did you actually start working on the book? Gosh, you're starting with the hard questions, Alice. <laughs> um, I actually began doing research on the original Twin Towers in the early 90s when I was working um, on my book on skyscrapers. And then uh, on September 10, 2001, I pitched my then publisher a book on American memorials. And he said, well, you know, Americans really aren't much for memorials. The next day, the towers fell. And so I wrote extensively about 9-11 um, in that book. And so the actual day-to-day -day work of uh, One World Trade Center, the new book, began, gosh, about three years ago. It was, but it was a nonstop effort. It had to be. I mean, this mm. book is so comprehensive. And of course, you know, some of us ha are not quite as immersed in the details of what yeah. was going on. But I remember when Daniel mm -hmm. Liebeskind was appointed, and then he was not working on it, and he was working on it. Yeah. And I saw interviews with him. He was very gracious about his being unseated, I guess. Tremendously. And um, I, he had never designed a skyscraper, as I understand it. No, he hadn't. So he there had might not. have been some justification for bringing in some other people, I guess. There are a lot of things at play. I would there, imagine. There were a lot, there was a lot at play. Now, you say in the book, he had a tremendous influence on the ultimate design of this yeah. building, although there is no attribution to him. Well, I think I say that you'd be mistaken mm -hmm. to um, think that, to you'd be mistaken to discount his influence. His fingerprints are all over 
the World Trade Center, but his name appears on no building. Wow. Yeah. And he's, he's okay with that? Or does he have to be okay with it? I think he made his peace some time ago okay. with that. I mean, he was selected to design the master plan, mm -hmm. and he and his firm, Studio Libeskin, did a tremendous job with the master plan. And then they uh, faded back as the architect Skidmore Owens and Merrill came to the fore. Mm -hmm. And uh, Libeskin has gone on to build extraordinary structures all over the world. Right. I mean, he's a wonderful architect yeah. and a very, very interesting man. Very interesting. We know that. Um, but, I, you know, watching his involvement, and for those of us who didn't know that much about constructing the building, we didn't realize all the hands that were involved in oh. it. And the realtors and the Durst Corporation and mm. Larry Silverstein. And yes. I mean, you've got to read the book to, to get the full story. We can't con reconstruct it for you. Yeah. Why was it important to rebuild this building? Oh, there were so many reasons to rebuild. But practically speaking, um, you know, there was, there was such disbelief and shock that accompanied the attacks on the, on the Twin Towers. But um, people might not recall that the next day, September 12th, Rudy Giuliani, who was then the mayor of New York City, said, vowed, we will rebuild. I understand that, but wasn't there a voice for people saying, let's not make another target? I mean, the Trade Center had been attacked in 1993. Exactly. Once before, and from people I know who worked there said that those people who were there in 93 got out of that building really fast. The yes. moment anything happened, they were mm -hmm. not waiting for anybody, yeah. any direction. So was there a contingent of voices saying, don't make another target? There were many, many opinions. And I think that it's a testimony to the democratic process that everyone's opinion was heard. Okay. Um, some people felt nothing at all should be built on this newly sacred ground, 16 acres in Lower Manhattan. Others felt that um, we are not going to let terrorists stop us from earning our livelihoods and, and uh, the site should be rebuilt. But practically speaking, there, were, there was a smoldering pit in, in the center of Lower Manhattan, where 70,000 people worked and, and uh, lived. And in order to uh, recoup his insurance proceeds, Larry Silverstein was obligated to rebuild. Another thing that many people don't know is that in Seven World Trade Center, the base of Seven World Trade Center, were um, the, Con Ed, the Con Ed substation that provided electricity to all of lower Manhattan. And so they went on to generators, but the fact that wasn't any kind of a long-term solution. So there were a lot of practical reasons why it had to be rebuilt. It's also an enormous transportation hub. Exactly. Is it not? I mean, exactly. it's where people come in from New Jersey and New York, and, and yes. it, it, I can't even know the thousands of people who travel there daily exactly. just to get to other places. There are 11 subway lines that converge at the World Trade Center, and then there are buses, there are ferries. So there are people, also, people were shut out of their offices. I mean, people couldn't, I'm sure many people in, in the audience know that. They couldn't get to work. They I mean, couldn't get I to mean, work. I mean, we all, we lived through it, and we know how frozen the city was yes. until yeah, other things happened. Describe what listening to the city was. That was a, a project in Lower Manhattan. Well, listening to the city was um, an initiative mm -hmm. by uh, the Lower Manhattan Development Corporation, mm -hmm. which oversaw the, the rebuilding mm -hmm. of the Trade Center. And so listening to the city was fashioned after an old time uh, town hall meeting. Okay. And 5,000 people over several days and um, online looked at the uh, proposed master plans and had you know, electronic voting uh, mechanisms at their table. And unfortunately, uh, the master plans that the LMDC proposed were roundly dismissed. And the participants at listening to the city there at the Javits Center, by the way, um, they said, go back, you have to do something better. Do you think that was worthwhile? Did oh, they yes. do something better? Absolutely, mm -hmm. absolutely. I think it was, it was uh, worthwhile. First of all, it got people, um, involved in the concept of architecture and urban planning in a way 
that we haven't seen since uh, the Chicago Tribune Tower for competition for a century example, ago. They were probably features of the old World Trade Center, the original World Trade Center, that were not so successful. Yes. And given the opportunity, architects and developers could now address those issues. Were those, what were some of the issues that people or architects raised about the inadequacy of the former buildings mm -hmm. and what they wanted to see happen in the newer ones? Well, as, as um, you well know, the, twin, the design of the Twin Towers, which opened in 1972, were not loved. And then they fell, and now, of course, they're enshrined in memory. But um, building technologies have changed so much in 30 years. It wouldn't make sense to rebuild the Twin Towers just as they were. You probably remember a lot of people were calling for that. Let's rebuild them just as they were, uh, only taller. See, I don't remember hearing that, but I wasn't involved in it as intimately as you were. Yeah. Um, my sentiment, and I worked on Wall Street at that time, was everybody hated them. I mean, they hated mm -hmm. it because it took so long to access the buildings to get exactly. across that horrible windy plaza. The, the plaza was windy, it was very inhospitable, and don't forget, they were built on an, uh, an elevated super block. So there was a lot of up and down, the right. stairs, the, the uh, subway connections below were just awful. The platforms were narrow and you had to go up Right. Three sets of stairs to, you know. I remember having go, to take yeah. two elevators to get to a friend's office, and people who worked in the building spent their entire lunch hour getting out of the building. Yes. To do the errands that we all did at lunch your banking, your shopping, I mean, the things that you let alone have lunch. Right. Um, but it took your entire lunch hour to get in and out of the building. Yeah. So that was one of the things. What was achieved in the new building that really was groundbreaking? So much. Engineers all over the world, architects, but engineers all over the world studied the collapse of the Twin Towers. They studied those structures. They, they looked at what went wrong. They also talked to the, um, the NYPD and the FDNY. Um, one fireman said, no one's ever asked us before. They, there were so many lessons learned. and. Um, you know, guidelines for building and for increased safety, increased security, uh, one of the silver linings that came out of 9-11. So practical things, widening the staircases. You know, um, they ever, no one can forget those terrible images of the firemen and women racing up the stairs while people were trying to escape the Twin Towers. Uh, practical things, they put uh, glow-in-the-dark strips on the stairs, so they widened the stairs. We've actually gotten bigger. They've done. We've gotten bigger since 9/11, oh. unfortunately. <laughs> so the stairs are 20 percent wider. People are larger. Um, right. The design of One World Trade Center is is uh, something entirely new for New York City. It has a concrete core, which is a very which creates a very safe uh, structure very stable structure, and it's used regularly in other parts of the world, but because of the pe peculiarities of how New York City unions work together, that uh, concrete core technology wasn't really used here. And after 9-11, um, you know, the architects and the engineers and the builders got together with the heads of the unions and said, we have to do it better. And so um, you'll see one has a concrete core. It's a hybrid structure. It has uh, a steel perimeter frame, but it has an interior concrete core, and that's where that strongest concrete in the world is used. And the core protects all the staircases, the, all of the elevators, um, the communication systems, everything that's vital. All the vital arteries of the building run through that core, so they're protected. How did building this building change codes in New York City? Well, it made it made it just just exactly as I said, made the buildings safer. It made it presumes a full evacuation of a building, as opposed to just but, parts of a building. But now those are enshrined in code, so every subsequent building must conform to um, the same rules. The actual or actually Seven World Trade Center and One World Trade Center still exceed New York City code, but they had a tremendous impact on how buildings are built and how the occupants are protected. So it's really been um, 
really wonderful for all skyscrapers to come. Rather transformative. Yeah. One thing I learned in reading the book was the enormous complexity of the Port Authority and the involvement mm. of the Port Authority. Yes. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about how that worked and what role did the Port Authority play? Did they own the pro former World Trade Center? Yes, and they still do. They still do. Um, and so the Port Authority was established in 1921, and it's a bi-state agency controlled by New York and New Jersey. Mm -hmm. And it, it answers to no one. And that was put in place so that the Port Authority could focus on its primary, um, primary work, which is the region's transportation network. And so they control the transportation network, the bridges, the tunnels, the airports, and the ports um, in a 1,500-square-mile radius around centering on New York Harbor. So it's a tremendously powerful organization. They, um, uh, Governor Pataki, George Pataki, who was the governor at the time, told the port that they had to rebuild the Trade Center. It's not that the Port Authority jumped up and said, hey, we want to rebuild it. They didn't. But there were, again, undeniable realities. They, um, the Port Authority was the only agency with deep enough financial resources to rebuild the World Trade Center. The city couldn't rebuild it. The state could not rebuild it. And the Port Authority also felt a moral obligation because 84 of their employees um, died that day. And they, they, against all odds and tremendous delays and cost overruns, all of that pales in comparison to what the Port Authority has accomplished down at the World Trade Center. Hmm. It's a tremendous project. And they have been um, very responsible stewards of that project. Now, the project nearly got derailed many mm. times. And yes. There's a lot of um, infusion of political issues in the Port Authority and in the Trade Center. After Pataki was Governor Elliot Spitzer, mm -hmm. who didn't serve for a very long time. And then, of course, in New Jersey, his counterpart, Governor McGreevy, yeah. was also unseated after yes. a short time. I mean, yes. we couldn't make this stuff up. No. The, gov the governance structure of the Port Authority um, only increased the complexity of the project. But when um, Spritzer resigned, uh, David Patterson appointed Christopher Ward, the executive director of the Port Authority. And Chris Ward had a really tough job. He basically had to examine the project and pull it apart and figure out how to make it work. He said at one point, he said to me, it had become monumentally unmanageable. And it had. There were so many people that had a legitimate claim on that site. I mean, usually you have an empty parcel of land, there's one owner, there's one building, you're done. That was absolutely not the case here. This is an, this is, um, an extremely political project, but it is a very complex structural pro project as well. It's like a Rubik's Cube under, underground. There, and there were so many people that had a legitimate claim on that site. So there were many, many masters that had to be served. And what Ward did was he examined everything and realized that there was a priority that no one could argue with, and that was completing the 9-11 memorial by the 10th anniversary. Okay, and the memorial, that is the ponds, the... The, the ponds two, that, excuse me, the two waterfalls. waterfalls. The two waterfalls, and then um, later the 9-11 Museum opened. Okay, and that did, he did achieve that? He certainly did. Extraordinary. But to do that, they had to rethink the very way they were constructing the Trade Center, and some very clever, very devoted engineers at the Port Authority restructured the construction so that the 9-11 uh, memorial could be completed by 2011. And the Port Authority spent tens of millions of dollars to make that happen. The Port Authority's actually been, you know, quite selfless. Yes, the bridge tolls are high, but the fact of the matter is they, um, they, had to, they were called to do the right thing on many occasions, and they did. I was really impressed with the numbers of hands involved, mm. the numbers of people. Yeah. For example, you talked about the Durst Corporation yes. and how important they became um, in the development of this project. Why would they need another entity 
when you've got the Port Authority and you've got the architects, yeah. why did the Durst Corporation get pulled into this? Well, uh, Larry Silverstein had purchased the rights uh, to operate the World Trade Center in the summer of 2001. And then um, it became apparent because of um, various financial reasons that it would not make sense to keep uh, Silverstein on as the developer of one and five World Trade Center. And so the Port Authority took over um, the development of one World Trade Center and Silverstein was given two, three, and four World Trade Center, which he's in the process of developing. Um, by 2010, the Port Authority realized they needed um, uh, 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 an expert developer of Class A office buildings to lease One World Trade Center, and that's when Durst came on. The Port Authority is actually uh, has long expertise in very complex engineering projects, but their expertise was not in um, Class A office buildings, and so that's Durst came on in 2010. And so what role did they play? Did they well, they, they, um, they helped develop one, and then they also are leasing that tower. So they have a view to what their clients, proposed tenants want, need. Absolutely. In a way that the Port Authority perhaps couldn't have that expertise. Yes, yes. Okay. So that's no, Durst, Durst was absolutely critical to the whole process, and what they did was they brought Condé Nast to the World Trade Center as as uh, an anchor tenant, and that was huge. Has that brought others along? Oh, absolutely. How much of the Trade Center is now leased? One. One uh, is about 70% leased, oh. but the, every time you pick up the paper, there's a new lease being signed. You know, people don't realize this. It, these are massive buildings. Yes. I mean, this is over 3 million square feet of office space, and this is just the one tower. And don't forget, there are, there are three other skyscrapers. One is open, but um, there are, are uh, two World Trade and three World Trade are kind of open, too. So there's, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a long, it's a long game filling these, these big buildings. And New York is so competitive. Mm -hmm. There's so much going on. We all talk about this. The amount of construction in New York is phenomenal. Yeah. You've got the Hudson Yards going up on the west yes. side of Manhattan, which is a whole other city yes. in itself. I don't know what the square footage of retail space is and residential space, but it's enormous. Yes. And then you've got the plans for redevelopment of Midtown East. I mean, mm -hmm. there's, there's just exactly. so much going on. Do you think that the Trade Center is a competitor to these other projects? Oh, or? absolutely, absolutely. But you know, it's it's it used to be um, all the financial companies, for instance, were down on Wall Street. Mm -hmm. um, th it's that is changing. So the uh, business centers of the city are located at the World Trade Center, um, Midtown, and then west of Penn Station. So Hudson Yards. Okay. Do you find who were the people who embraced downtown? I think okay. that um, uh, young creatives, a lot of uh, technology, a lot of communications companies. I mean, Condé Nast asked an inter interesting question uh, when they were thinking about moving down to one, and that they wanted to know about uh, transportation available to their young employees. They're not living in Greenwich. They're not living in Westchester County. They're not living in Manhattan unless they're extremely fortunate. And most of them are even priced out of Brooklyn. So what are the subway lines that will bring um, these young creatives, you know, from New Jersey, from the Bronx, from Queens, and, um, you know, the outskirts of Brooklyn? Well, there's lots written about this fantastic transportation site, mm. it's, which has just opened. Yes. Uh, it's, was it about a year now that it's open? It's Maybe not even. Not even. Yeah. Not even a year. And I have not yet been to it, so I can't give you oh, my review. You'll love it. But it's supposed to be absolutely out of this world. It's stunning. It's like it's like a, a secular cathedral designed by uh, Santiago Calatrava. And I, I was just there yesterday afternoon. I've been there many times. But it is pristine. It is white. Soaring ceilings. And um, when I interviewed Calatrava and I asked him about that design, he said, you know, I wanted to elevate the experience of the people who come to work, commute to work, day in and day out, the backbone of, of not just New York City, but of the entire nation. Um, 
who wanted to elevate their daily experience. Well, what a tribute, because formerly mm -hmm. the transportation in and out of the Trade Center area was pretty grim. Ah, oh, nightmare. It was, I mean, it was not a pleasant experience going to work. Yeah. Um, and this is a remarkable experience. I mean, this is a destination site. Yes. We haven't that much more time, but how many buildings are there in the entire site? Well, right now there are, you know, there are nine major structures, but we've, um, not all of them are quite open, but they're soon to be. And um, we just learned a few weeks ago that funding has been gotten for the World Trade Center PAC, which is the Performing Arts yeah. Center, which will uh, bring another enormously important cultural component to the site. Has downtown Manhattan been the recipient, or the down, lower Manhattan Development Corporation and the downtown area been uh, become more desirable a place to live? In oh, the absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, of course and, and you know, the project is this wonderful give back mm -hmm. to everyone that lives below Canal Street because there's improved transportation. Uh, a whole raft of stores is is opening. When I worked down there, you had Century 21. Exactly. And there was a Wanamaker's, a John yeah. Wanamaker's on Nassau Street. Right. And they couldn't care less about, well, women. I mean, you need something, honey, you know, figure it out. Right. Um, which was pretty remarkable to a yeah. young person working on Wall Street at the time. Yes. There was no place to shop. No, it was a ghost town. After five, I lived on Greenwich Street for 20 years, so absolutely. I remember, you know, we'd have to go into the village to just even to get groceries, mm -hmm. I mean, so. But, um, but now, they're wonderful parks. They're street, the street grid has been reconnected. There is such a vibrancy downtown. So um, many, many things have improved. And even though it will never bring back everyone who was lost on 9-11 and all the other losses that we suffered, the intangible losses that so many of us suffered that day, um, it is, it is a good thing. A remarkable tribute. I have to laugh because with all the technological advances, the remarkable things that have been achieved in that building, the windows still have to be washed by hand. Oh, incredible. <laughs> Remember when the window washers got stuck uh, outside? I mean, I and people were like, uh, you know, people were in shock because, you know, we were all people watching always it. holding their breath when right. it comes to the World Trade Center. Right. Um, but once, once, once the relief that those two men were saved, the next question mm. was, are people still washing That's windows? Still washing. <laughs> well, with all the <clears throat> achievements in this building, the technological right. achievements, the LEED certification and all, um, one does wonder why they couldn't have done that. But well, I guess because can. robots can't, uh, can't see dirt like a human being. This book is truly magnificent. Mm. Is the pricing an error? <laughs> it was, I mean, I, I know I received my copy and it said $35. Yeah. Can that really be so? It is absolutely, it is extraordinary and and we, I wanted to make I wanted it to be a book that everyone could get it's accessible yeah. now it's beautiful the photographs are worth it alone but mm -hmm. Judith makes the story come alive Thank and you. I hope that our viewers plan to buy this book and do buy it they can buy it from little brown of course it's available on Amazon yeah you're doing a couple of road shows absolutely tell us um, the uh, September 19th okay at Mamaroneck High School I will be get, talking about the World Trade Center, and that talk is free and open to the public. Okay. And then um, for the Center for Continuing Ed, also in Larchmont, Maranek, I am giving a private tour. <clears throat> excuse me, I'm giving a private tour of the World Trade Center, and that's to benefit the Center for Continuing Ed. But that okay. will be a fantastic day long. You know, it sounds, visit downtown. Sign me up. I'm going to be there. Better so sign people, up soon. So, I think tickets oh, are going so fast. on. So go to the uh, LMC uh, lo lower. What, wait, I'm sorry. Center, Center for Continuing okay. Ed, Larchmont Marinick Center for Continuing Ed. I That's never it. did that right. That's go it. Go to their website. Sign up for that September 19th. Yes. A private tour with Judith Dupre. It will be worth it. I've been thank to you. places with you, and <laughs> I, 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 I will be there. Um, Judith, thank you so much for being my guest. Thank you for writing this wonderful book. Oh, my you pleasure. Made the Trade Center and its ensemble buildings come alive. Ah, thanks, I wish Alice. you best of luck with it. I'm Alice Bloom. This is A Town in Village 2. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you next time.